community. So um, I'm going to let these guys introduce themselves and then we're going to dive into the questions. All righty. I'm going to pass the mic. We have another mic. Um, Todd will get it. Morning, everybody. My name is John Seib. I'm the administrator at Majestic Care of Carmel. It's one of 40 buildings in the Majestic Care family. It's located at Main Street in Pennsylvania, so right in the middle of Carmel. I have had the opportunity to uh, help build that facility. We bought it and did a multi-million dollar renovation of a building that had been right there in the center of Carmel for 40 years. So to work on it as a revitalization project and bringing it back up to a, a solid standard. Our our focus as a community is, as a CCRC, is to provide basically any level of care that is necessary for an individual during, you know, their their elder years. So we have independent living, assisted living, um, rehab, and long-term care all on the same campus is what that means. And uh, it gives us the opportunity to allow people to age in place. So, you know, I mean, once someone decides to make a move into a community, it can be, you know, it's, it's a lot of work. It can be very traumatic. It's, um, you know, it's very tough to move from place to place to place. So our goal is to provide a community where people can move to one place and then they can, if they need a higher level of care, they can move within that community instead of going through hiring, moving people and getting everything boxed back up and then downsizing again and again and again. So it saves people from that. But uh, we focus on a, a affordability and community. And, uh, you know, we've done, uh, please come by and see us. We've done a really good job in the campus. It's been quite a fun journey. Oh, and I should tell you the microphone is mostly for the people online. So you have to, you're, you're doing fine, um, but so that they can hear us online. So don't be shy about that microphone. And also if they're back here, you know, sometimes they can, they, yeah. Okay. Um, hi everyone. Um, I'm Catherine Palmer, but I go by Kate. Um, I'm with the Springs of Mooresville. Um, we're a trilogy facility. Um, I also have Wellbrook of Westfield and Wellbrook of Carmel here with me today. They're in the back. Um, all of our buildings um, do provide a full continuum of care. So we have assisted living, long-term care, skilled nursing, and then um, some of our buildings also have memory care. <laughs> I, I guess I can... I'm <laughs> going. Yeah. All right. I'm going to try to do my DJ voice for the people online. Uh, my name is Dave Holder. I'm the owner of Assisted Living Locators, so I'm not a community. I help people navigate senior living options. Um, seven years ago, my father-in-law was diagnosed with dementia. He was in the home in Carmel. We weren't very proactive. We didn't know what options were out there. We didn't know how much it cost, what questions to ask. And like most families, our hair was on fire. It was a mad scramble to find out where to go, and we had to move him twice. So it was very stressful, very emotional. And I decided to open the first assisted living locators here in Indiana to help families navigate those options, make good decisions, know what questions to ask, know the difference between assisted living and memory care and what is a sniff. So that's my job. And um, yeah, thanks for having me here. Yes. Hi, everyone. I'm Amy Morgan with Westminster Village North. I'm celebrating 20 years of working in the healthcare industry, and boy, has it really kind of done some hills and valleys, but I'm very blessed. Um, I like to see myself as a resource, so whenever someone comes to our community to ask about independent living options or assisted living, I could be a wealth of knowledge and just kind of hold their hand through the process. Um, our campus is nestled in Lawrence, Indiana, just about six miles from here. It's a 57-acre beautiful campus that has independent homes and cottages, duplexes. We have luxurious apartments for independent living, assisted living, uh, beautiful apartments as well with a little bit of help. And then we also have two memory care units, a short-term rehab unit, and long-term care. So we are a CCRC, a continuing care so that you can age in place. Um, and hopefully you give me some good questions today. I'm excited to uh, speak with you. Thanks got 23 years so i got you by a few uh -oh. <laughs> they're not uh, we're not competitive or anything <laughs> uh i'm sean howe i'm the director of uh, corporate strategy for american senior communities uh we are the 
uh, seventh largest employer in the state of Indiana. We are Indiana owned and operated uh, community. We have over 100 communities. I'm here representing American Village today, who is a sponsor. Our general manager and sales and marketing person is in the back of the room. Uh, American Village has independent living apartments, garden homes, assisted living, memory care, skilled nursing. So we run the gambit there as well. But we have over 100 communities throughout the entire state. Uh, and we run all those gambits from independent living all the way through skilled. Bingo's and happy hour. All right. <laughs> I think it's safe to say we have all sides of town covered with this amazing panel. And so we're going to dive into some really good questions. And I encourage you all to, to ask follow-up questions. Um, sometimes the, 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 the question that doesn't get asked is the most important. So don't be shy. This is a safe place and you've got, you've got them right here in front of you. Uh, and, and so, yeah, don't be don't be shy to ask those follow up questions. Uh, that with the that goes for the same folk with the well, I can't speak with the people online too. Don't be shy, ask questions. Uh, okay, so that was question number one. Please introduce yourself and uh, give a little background um, about uh, your company. Now let's uh, go to question number two. Um, describe the different senior living options available and what they generally mean. So uh, Dave said sniff. What is AL, IL, all those acronyms that we use in this industry that, that these folks should know? Oh, okay. Well, so, I mean, really the, the level of senior living that you're looking at depends on your independence and your function and how much help you need. Uh, you can receive different, independent living is essentially very much the same as a senior apartment where you would live and have, you know, you can opt into like a food program if you want, or you could make all your meals in your apartment as if you were somewhere else. It just has the ability to give you some extra support for yourself. If you need some help, there will be people in the immediate vicinity that you can ask for help. Um, then assisted living is that next tier where you're going to get direct nursing services on a regular basis. So if you need help with medications, that is where the nurse will come to your room and provide you help with those medications. You will automatically have access to a, a dining program where you will be served three meals a day. And, you know, the activity portion of campuses are typically include both those areas. And at least at our campus, it does. So independent living and assisted living um, they would all eat in this in our in our community all eat in the same same master dining room. Uh, then our activities we have you know different ventures out into the community. I think I mentioned that we are in the middle of Carmel, so we are we are off Main Street, so we are down the street from all the Main Street shops. There's a Meyer very close, so we do regular trips out into the community to do that and other arts and entertainment things to take advantage of you know the Carmel sort of thing they have going on, which is, if anyone remembers Carmel from 20 years ago, it is not the same Carmel. I I, I, del I did drove delivery there years and years ago. It's very different. Um, then um, skilled nursing is that that next level, it, and it really encompasses rehab and long-term care and memory care. Um, there are some there are some assisted living memory care options out there. I'll let one of my competitors talk about that because we don't offer assisted living memory care at our campus. But um, that is when you're going to need 24-hour nursing assistance. Uh, rehab is more focused on that short term. We have a lot of people that will have you know, small health emergencies that can go into rehab. And we work on getting them better to get them back into their apartment so they can continue to you know, live their life as freely and as independently as possible. And I think that's really the focus of all the CCRCs is to try to maintain your independence as much as we can, um, that you can stay to your highest level of function, uh, to have you be a contributing member of the community. I know we like to encourage our residents to come up with different things that they want to do when it comes to activity programming or if they want to lead groups uh, we're pretty proud of, um, we have like a maker space right now, which is pretty popular. Um, I don't like getting to that. That's sort of way, that's way off question and way off topic. Um, I could talk for a while if you could tell. 
<laughs> but uh, does anyone else want to talk about the different levels of senior living? I, we also do Medicaid waiver, which is a specialized program that is no different than AL from what it offers, but it does allow for uh, people who can't quite afford some of the very expensive offerings out there to afford the same same level of service and living that um, people pay, you know, quite thousands and thousands of dollars for at a private pay assisted living. Let's go down to Sean and we'll just go back and forth. So then after Sean, Kate, and then yeah. we'll land on the <laughs> Yeah, I think the only thing I want to add is uh, on the AL memory care that he mentioned. So, you know, there is a distinguishing difference between AL memory care and skilled memory care. Uh, AL memory care, they're usually pretty functional still. Yes, they have that diagnosis of dementia, Alzheimer's, um, but it's still early stage. Um, so those folks are still social. They still want to interact. They just may have those moments of forgetfulness. Uh, where in skilled memory care, it is usually more of a moderate uh, or even higher level of dementia. So those folks are needing more attention, more focus uh, on that side. The other thing I'll mention is I, I don't think anybody in this room, and, and me included, and probably everybody on this panel included, I don't think we grow up thinking, oh, I'm going to end up in a nursing home someday or in an assisted living or in one of these places. The reality is 70% of people over the age of 65 need some level of care at some point, whether that's home health, rehab, something. So I, I think it's just one of those things we have to understand when it's that time for us to make those decisions. Uh, independent living, American Village, they have their own apartment complex, so it's all independent. So they are all by themselves, uh, high-functioning folks, almost 100% of them, and correct me if I'm wrong, participate in the dining program because the food, they love the food over there. They love the activities. We got a huge lake uh, on the campus, so a lot of people go like to go walk around the lake. So um, as far as all the levels of care, I think he described them perfectly. I just wanted to distinguish those little things. Okay. Um, so for Trilogy, um, we do have uh, assisted living memory cares as well. Um, and then also we do have some memory cares that are skilled, but majority of ours are assisted living. Um, what sets us apart though, is that our assisted livings do, um, we try and age in place. So we go up to like two people assisting you for everything on our assisted livings. We can provide nursing care on assisted living. Um, we're a licensed assisted living and then the same with our memory care. Um, so kind of we can provide more care than other assisted living. Some assisted living only go up to like one person assisting you for things. Um, and so, yes, our goal is to let you live in your apartment as long as possible. The nice thing about our assisted livings too is that um, a lot of our facilities don't have independent living. They just have assisted living. Um, so you can be as independent as possible, but have the peace of mind to know that if you need nursing care and you need nursing services, they're right down the hall. You still have, will we'll have your own apartment, um, your own kitchenette, and then all of your meals are included, your activities are included and things like that. I agree with what everyone's saying. Um, Westminster also has a assisted living that is more skilled. And then we have an assisted living that's um, for memory care that is a locked unit just for safety. But a lot of those residents can still do a lot for themselves. They just need a little extra cueing and guiding. Um, the one goal that we have is let's keep you in independent living as much as we can. You know, you can in our community add some home health, add hospice. We, we try to keep you there because most people invest in independent living and we want you to stay there as long as possible. So that's always our goal. We do do some things in the apartments to, to help you. Uh, for instance, everyone will get a, a life alert pendant. Either know you're independent living, you still have that just in case of emergency. And we do have some pull cords in the bathrooms too. Um, but we trust if you're independent living that once you close your door to your apartment, you know how to bathe, take your medicine and eat properly and so on. So um, the one thing I will say is uh, don't wait too long to make decisions because I've seen it so much in my career where people wait and wait and they miss out on that piece of independent living and they jump straight into a higher level of care like assisted living or skilled or short-term rehab. And so, so often you kind of miss out on that fun part of living in a community where there's people of your same age and activities. So just 
don't don't wait too long because you don't want to jump into a higher level of care. Live your best life and, and living in an independent living community. And there's several great ones that uh, we're blessed to have so many wonderful communities in our Indianapolis. To add to that, um, with um, moving in earlier. So what's nice about that is that you get to keep your kind of like your quality of life. You are in a set routine. We'll keep you in the same routine that you were at at home. If you want to not wake up until 11 or go to bed at midnight, you can do those types of things and be able to keep in your same routine and live in your apartment and have the peace of mind knowing like you're going to get your meds every single day at the same time. You're going to have like good, um, wholesome meals, um, different things like that, that will help kind of make sure that you are staying healthy and um, kind of aging gracefully. And then um, after that, you know, if you need outpatient therapy on our assisted living, we provide outpatient services. So, and our therapists that do our skilled nursing also do our outpatient therapy. So um, they're really well-trained therapists and they can help you just get maintenance therapy where you can, you know, walk for longer and um, be able to keep your endurance and things like that, that will help um, you when you're aging and continue to age in place. So, so my role is to help you navigate all of those things. So understand what those definitions are. I'm almost like a realtor, like Sarah and Lisa. But He's for our buyer's living. agent. Yeah, for senior <laughs> living. So you, I can help you. Well, if you're looking Maybe you're downsizing from your home. Maybe a garden home is a nice step in for independent living as opposed to going into an apartment. So we'll talk about the plus and minuses of, of all of those things. Talk about how long you can stay in assisted living before maybe someone needs to go to memory care. Um, I get calls that mom's got a diagnosis of dementia. We need a memory care. Not necessarily. Let's talk about where she's at and what could be a good fit. So that's where I help you personalize this and provide options so you don't have to go out and tour 10 or 11, we can, we can look at three or four and, and make good decisions and ask good questions. And Dave is an advocate for his clients. So he's an advocate as you go into um, tour communities. Um, we have a question online and then we have a question back in the back too. So if you're online, uh, you can unmute your mic and ask the question or do you want to ask? Is, okay, go ahead, Sarah. Sarah's asked. Uh, Sue from the online audience would like you to kind of share what Medicare covers in any of these different levels of living and if they cover anything. Hey, Todd, something's bugging me. Will you click OK on your screen? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I keep seeing this blue button. All right, go ahead. Uh, with regards to uh, skilled nursing care, uh, there is Medicare coverage. So the thing to know, though, is the difference between traditional Medicare and then the Medicare Advantage plans because that's where they get you sometimes is there can be co-pays involved from day one where traditional Medicare covers you for longer. So depending on the rehab stay, and there's also a lot of these managed Medicares out there now, I will say those lengths of stays are much shorter. They want to keep you, get you in, get you out. That's their goal. If it's long-term stay, your Medicare eventually needs to switch to a Medicaid. So funds will exhaust. That's just the reality. Now in the senior living space, it is a private pay model or a Medicaid waiver model. So when I say private pay, that's your Social Security, that's any pensions, retirement funds, VA uh, pays for parts of senior living. If you have uh, veterans, uh, if you're a veteran or your spouse is a veteran, so there are those type of plans as well. So there are those type of accesses to the payments. Uh, the waiver is very unique um, as far as for those people that are eventually going to exhaust funds, we can get you switched to waiver. And then, of course, the state pays for that. It is a flat rent rate you pay a month. It's 941 now. I knew it switched recently. So it's 941. Uh, that, that's all you pay. Uh, in the senior living space, so you get your care, you get your food, you get all that stuff in the space once you have to switch to waiver. So that's more of a long-term plan if you think you're eventually going to exhaust funds. Uh, there are several great waiver communities in the state of Indiana. I know our gentleman down there mentioned he accepts it. I have communities that accept it. So I know we have plenty that do. Uh, we also work with families that are in that. You know, We know you get X amount of funds. We know when that end date is. So we've got to start working with you from day one to try to help you get Medicaid uh, and, and switch to that eventually. So when you say Medicare, it's much more for the skilled space than it is the assisted living, senior living space. Anyone else have anything to add to that? 
Hold on, get up that get the mic so people can hear you online. Oh, I'm sorry. So what I would add is that a lot of the coverage you get from Medicare when you're at home, like you have, you can have therapists come to your home. If you have a doctor's order for therapy at home, you can get those same services in the assisted living or the independent living model. Um, I know you would mention Katie, Katie, that, that you have that. And that's very typical of most assisted livings. You'll have either home health providers that they partner with, or sometimes their company will have their own home health provider that will also be an option. That is still your option that you choose that one or a different one. So they'll be able to provide in, in home therapy. Um, people that are on Medicaid and Medicaid waiver can get different Medicaid assistance through also through the waiver program. So in home aids to provide additional assistance. So Medicare in AL and independent living will act pretty much similar to what it is at home, unless you need that skilled rehab stay. And that's when it comes into play that you would talk about rehab and how long you have and whether or not you have an advantage or a Medicare plan always comes to play because, you know, uh, qualifications and government regulations are going to be a part of all of that process. Yes. And all of these folks are the marketing people guide guide that will guide you through that process. Kate? Um, the only thing that I have to have add is that um, if you're doing inpatient skilled nursing, um, you have to qualify with a, if you have Medicare traditional, you have to have a three night hospital stay before you can use that Medicare benefit. Um, Medicare Advantage plans right now, a lot of them have a, a waiver where you can just automatically do a prior authorization from the hospital, but you do have to have an authorization to go into a skilled nursing facility from your insurance for inpatient therapy. And then um, as far as a rehab stay, usually roughly about 20 days for that, um, depending on what insurance you have and things like that. I did include in your guys's blue folders um, information on the difference between Medicare and Medicare Advantage and the 2024 Medicare Guide to Benefits that explains the benefits that you have with Medicare Traditional and what is covered. Anybody else? And uh, at Westminster Village, you you all accept Medicaid as well, yeah? <laughs> we do. Uh, we accept Medicaid in our long-term care unit as well as our memory care unit. So um, other than that, um, I, I always say when you talk insurance, Medicare short, Medicaid long, <laughs> <That's good. laughs> because it's we could do an entire presentation Absolutely. on insurance. Yeah, so we could. Just think, Medicare short, long-term long. Okay, we have a question back here. Oh, is it? Good. Okay. I have a question back here and then I'm going to run over to you too. So you started to touch on it. My question was about the veterans. I was wondering if veterans are stuck with the Lafayette facility where it sounded like the veterans could maybe take that authorization and go into one of your facilities. And so if so, is there like an allowance amount? Like, So there's an aid and attendance benefit that veterans qualify for. Um, it's again, that's, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but it's around $2,000 a month. Uh, it may have gone up. There's a cost of living increase every year, yeah, right? So, yeah. so it's probably a little more than 2000 now, but that can be put towards a senior living stay. So if you wanted to move into an assisted living or independent living community, you can use that VA, VA benefit. A lot of us up here probably offer VA discounts on top of that. Uh, I know we do. So we give our veterans discounts to all of our communities. So uh, there's a lot of local entities, similar to the way Dave's a local entity. There's national entities too. I discourage the national entities uh i you know google's good google's made us all a little more informed i wouldn't say it made us more educated um so so uh you know and i i don't mean to give dave a commercial but i will i would 1000 percent you rather work with dave than work with an entity like a place for mom because a place for mom is just a national placement agency they have no skin in the game they just want to place you they're not involved dave is personally involved i have watched dave walk uh, people into communities and tour with them. He asked the questions they may not ask. Dave is a champion for seniors in the, the city of Indianapolis. So I will promote him all day long. <laughs> Aw, Dave, you get all the love, Dave. <laughs> I'm just going to continue that love. I, we referred him to a coworker of mine for her mom. And I have heard her say, I 
so appreciate Dave for helping me guide where my mom is at. It was a really tough decision because she had her at her home taking care of her and it just was getting too much. A compliment of her was that she's referred people to him as well. So, yeah. um, Nice. We're going to love on Dave today. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, do you all use the same indicators to move someone from assisted to skilled? That's a really good question. That is a really good question. I, I will tell you, there's probably some different indicators ba based on the community. Um, I, for in my career, most of the inner indicators are similar. You know, number one uh, would be medications. Are you taking medications properly? Um, that is usually a trigger to say, okay, if you're not taking your meds or taking too much or not taking them at all, then we need to have maybe a nurse help you with that, which would trigger a move to assisted living. Um, another thing, another trigger or indicator that I'm sure is on most of ours is, you know, bathing. Can you bathe yourself properly and safely without help? And if you can't, then obviously that would be an indicator. Um, if you're having multiple falls, and 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 I'm not saying you know one fall a week because we all have falls, but if it's happening on a consistent basis, um, then that could be an indicator as well. Um, and then another one is toileting. You know, if you're having some issue with toileting, you know that could trigger a higher level of care. That's kind of the basis of where I've seen most indicators. Anybody else? And you guys, there's an acronym for what you're talking about. Do you want to share the activities of daily living? Yeah, yeah ADLs. So activities of daily living, um, that's kind of toileting, bathing, dressing, grooming, um, basic hygiene, transferring, and then locomotion. So um, those are all points that we use. Um, my building doesn't specifically have an independent living, but when we do an assisted living evaluation, those are things that we look at. Um, we're kind of on, when we do an evaluation, it's kind of like a point system. We'll do an evaluation before somebody moves into our assisted living. And then obviously we like to age in place. We can do more nursing care than some other assisted livings can. Um, and then whenever we look at somebody moving from assisted living to long, to more skilled nursing, that's when we look at um, kind of what level of care they're at. Are they having, you know, reoccurrent falling where they need more hands-on nursing care? Um, how are they doing with like transfers and things like that? Are they now, you know, needing a lift instead of just people helping assist them? Do they now need a lift? Because um, that's going to be kind of more, you know, um, skilled nursing. Um, one thing that we do though is um, we try and still, even if they are needing a lift off and on, we'll, you know, do things like put therapy in place or put interventions in place to try and continue to keep you in your assisted living room before we make that decision. And then if it is consistent and you are needing more and more care and it's just not super safe for you to still be on assisted living and you really need that hands-on nursing care, that's when we will look at moving you. I have a question for you on that topic. Why is that important? Um, so it's really important to keep you in your same kind of environment um, just because it, it, it's your home. Um, you know, that's that's your apartment. That's your home. We want you to, you know, stay in that area. Now, obviously, if you move into our long term care side, you can still decorate. You can still set it up how you want. Um, it'll still be your home. Um, but obviously we want you to try and age in place because that's where you're going to be most comfortable. Yeah. So aging in place isn't typical. It's not just, I'm going to stay in my home, uh, where I raised my family, even though I only use 10% of the home because I can't go up the stairs or down the stairs. Uh, so I just stay in my kitchen and we've even seen hospital beds and dining rooms, uh, aging in place is aging in the right place, right? Yeah. Okay. Did you want to add to that? Just that, I mean, it's a great question. Um, a lot of a lot of facilities have different tiering of what services they provide when they do an assessment. So there is a way to sort of categorize what level of need someone has. But that is also to say that everyone's journey is going to be a little different. 
and every every situation, every person is unique in what their needs are. So that determination of, I mean, the bright line rule is that more than two late loss ADLs. So if you need help with more than two things, the that we have to provide, it's when they want us to move people along the continuum. But there are ways to supplement those when we talked about home health and AIDS coming in or or even sometimes some people will do private duty to try to supplement those ADL cares to stay in place where they are and provide those services. So um, again, it's a, it's a tricky question and it's a great question because, you know, sometimes it just means, well, we're going to provide X amount of services. So the cost is going to go up and there is a fee schedule at every facility you're going to look at for different tiers of care. Then, you know, what does your Medicare will to provide if it comes to a home health benefit to try to keep you or to supplement that care to maybe keep that level of care lower? So there, there are a lot of different strategies that I, um, everybody up here will definitely help you explore to try to find what works best for you. Because again, no two people are different or no, no two people are the same and everyone's experience is going to be a little bit different. So it's it's really, for, for me, it's very much a safety concern when we realize someone is to a point where they're not going to, like, if you have a single health event, we're not going to say, no, no, you need to move on to this. Like one event isn't a thing, but a trend over time that's not, that's not turning around is going to be when we start having those conversations. And it's really a safety thing and whether or not environment's going to help you thrive. Okay. Anybody else? We're going to move on to the next question if there are no other questions online or in the in-person audience. Okay, we touched on this one a little bit. Uh, can residents personalize their living space? So those communities, um, can they personalize their living space and maybe elaborate a little bit on that? Almost. We, while under assisted living rules, we are all have a... We, we have to provide furniture if you need it. Almost every one of my residents bring in and personalize their own space with their own belongings. I mean, you know, every time we move, I talked about downsizing and downsizing and downsizing. We've had these things that are nice things that we've had for years. And, you know, I, I can't, I can say I'm the same way. I, I, I've, I've moved multiple times and I'll find a box and I'll look in it and I'm like, I don't need anything in that box. And I'm not sure why I carried it through three different moves. I'm going to take these two things out of this giant box and the rest of it can go somewhere else. But a uh, uh, long answer, short question is yes, you can, we expect almost everyone there will bring in their own stuff. We will provide additional furniture for people uh, for our waiver residents. A lot of them can get grants from Sokoa if they don't have furniture to help, you know, put furniture and things into their apartment and televisions. I mean, there's, the the resources you have through that programming is pretty it's pretty robust so there are opportunities to bring stuff in or if you need something you ask for it and we're going to try to find a way to, a solution for it um, we do have and most communities will have extra furniture and things around that they can assist you with so but if you have a picture we we want you to personalize your space when it comes to assisted living and independent living and in long-term care now rehab i mean it's a short-term stay so I'm I'm not going to decorate my hotel room. I'm going to live with what's there and then I'm going to try to get back to my apartment and when I get home from my vacation I'm going to be back to my things instead of someone else's idea of what they thought was nice. Um but uh we try our best in both areas and we really we encourage that. Okay, sure. Um at Westminster the answer is always yes, yes, yes. This is your space, you make it your own. Um I'll kind of break it down with houses and cottages on our community. I mean you make choices on what colors the paint the walls and what flooring you want, what countertops and so on. So yes, you can personalize a house. You can also personalize an apartment. Um, you can choose colors to paint the walls. You can change the floors and also add uh, quartz countertops. So yes, yes, yes. Um, we want you to make it your home and we want it to be comfortable. Um, but the good thing is, is when you do move in, our maintenance guys will hang everything for you. So you don't have to worry about hanging a big TV and all of that fun stuff. Um, in assisted living, same thing. Bring your furniture. But like he had said, if you don't have furniture, we have some that can help you because that might be a quick 
quick move. Um, but we want it to be your home. So yes, personalize it the way you want. I one time had a person put a different paint color on every wall. And I said, wow, that's like a rainbow. But hey, if that's your choice, that's awesome. So, so yes, make it your home. Um, so our, um, assisted livings, we do allow you guys to bring any furniture from home, make it as homey as possible. You actually can paint the walls on our assisted living. We'll, we'll do it for you, but you just pick the color. Um, and then hang anything. We'll repaint and everything if you ever move. Um, and then also our furniture that we include is, um, going to be a bed, a nightstand, a dresser, a desk, or a table and chairs. Um, and then we also, um, have hospital beds. If you need that on assisted living, you can have a hospital bed. We also have twin size and full size beds. Um, or you guys can bring any of your furniture from home. Um, and you guys can move the furniture a thousand times. Um, we have maintenance department and they'll help you. Um, and they'll help you get everything set up. So, um, yes, the apartments are however you want them to be. Only thing I'll add, uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, everything they said, um, the only thing I will add is, you know, ASE, we do have a unique uh, staff member who is an interior designer. So she actually works with our folks that move in, especially if you have that unique piece of furniture, you're not sure if it'll fit. She works with you all. She'll go out to your home. She'll measure it. And she would be like, yeah, I know exactly where she should put it. So um, we have that person on staff that does that for you all. Dave, <laughs> do you have a favorite... Uh like level of of what they what the communities that you uh travel to um allow or not allow i don't know i don't know that geez you really put me on the I spot know. for that you don't have um, to you don't yeah, have to give the favorite um, all these ones right yeah <laughs> uh, um <laughs> so what i what i would i would just add to that I, i'm not answering the question i think directly as you're um that's okay. Asking it. So anytime you move into a community, what I always remind families is that whole community is your home. So your how your apartment yeah. or your garden home is just going to kind of be your sanctuary and where you sleep. If you move into a community, you've just inherited a movie theater. You've just inherited a dining room. You've just inherited the common space because as we age, right, our, our, our house gets smaller and smaller. You might live in a four bedroom house, but you're probably going between the living room, the kitchen, and maybe the bathroom. And you're not, but when you move into a community, you've got everything there. So think about not just your living space and you can decorate that, like they said, with all of your own things, but you've got all this other common space that, that's yours too. So, yeah, that's a gr very great point. You have all this other space that you don't have to maintain anymore. You don't have to pay taxes on anymore. And uh, you can use it, including the formal dining room. Many locations have a formal dining room if you're used to hosting holidays um, and you still want to, that's something that you want to do. They have beautiful um, dining rooms to, to host your family. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the next one we've touched on a little bit. Oh, yes, sir. Maybe stated it here, but uh, um, these personalizing uh, decisions you make on painting, flooring, whatever, I assume there is a cost uh, to implement those. Yeah, good, good question. So it's our process at Westminster that um, we provide you with, uh, our paint is Sherwin-Williams. There's no cost. You just choose whatever color you want. Um, you know, we also provide quartz countertops. You just pick on a selection of what we want. Obviously, if you decide you want a higher level, you can pay the difference, but we include our samples. Uh, flooring, you also have several choices and that's included. I don't know if that's at every community, but that's how it is in our world. So anybody yeah. want to add to that? Is there a cost for painting? No, same. Uh, the only thing I will add is the interior designer that we have as well. She's free of charge as well. I mean, her service is free. Okay, great. That was a really great question. Here's one more. Our are pets allowed? Good question. Yes. Um, we do allow pets. Um, we on just on our assisted living, um, and independent living, obviously. Um, but uh, well, if tell us why it's only assisted living and independent living. 
because um, you have to be able to still provide the care for your animal. Um, so at all of our buildings, we do have several courtyards. We always have one of our courtyards is usually like fenced in. So you'll have an area for your pet. Um, and then you just have to be able to kind of take care of that animal. If it gets to the point where you really aren't able to anymore, then we might start having a conversation about you know, maybe moving your pet or what that looks like. But as long as you're able to care for your pet, you're able to have one. Um, and there is a pet fee at our facility. Um, there's one that you pay like a pet deposit. Um, and that's it. I don't think that there's like a monthly fee. Um, and there are companies, uh, maybe some of the communities mm -hmm. here know about them who come into senior communities and walk your pet for you or take care of it. They're um, one of them is uh, in our area is home instead. They'll come in and they're kind of like private duty care, but they'll come in and take care of your animal for you if you want to. Isn't there one at Westminster village when Laura was there? She mentioned, I thought it was yeah. a great company. Yeah. It's a, it's a local company to Lawrence. I think it's called Paul's and play or something, but they actually have uh, dog walkers and we have a Dalmatian <laughs> that lives in assisted living right now. You probably have seen it, but obviously the Dalmatian needs to be walked all the time and is very active. So we have dog walkers that are here every day and they, they take them out and let them use the restroom and so on. Be sure to ask that question to every community. Do you allow pets? Because there are some that don't. So, and what are the restrictions? Yeah. Sometimes they might be, you know, maybe a weight or height restriction. So great questions to always ask a community. And like I said, there are some that do, some that don't, um, but we, we love communities that have pets. It's pets are our baby sometimes, and we hate to separate mother from the baby. Yeah. Great question. You want to add to it? Anyone? Okay. Uh, okay. So any, any questions online? Just check in real quick. Any other questions? Uh, let's go on to how do you ensure safety and security within the community? We talked a little bit about activities of daily living, um, but maybe talk about when the doors are locked, how guests enter the community and, and what has to happen there and, and things like that. All right, I'll start. Um, we do have several doors on our community because we're so large. Um, they do lock uh, around nine o'clock at night, except for our front entrance because we have receptionists there at all times, 24 seven. Um, we also have our own security crew that comes in about uh, five o'clock in the evening and they're on all night. And uh, I'll be honest, most of our security uh, is answering a raccoon up a pole or <laughs> but um, it's nice to have them there because that's additional eyes and they're there on weekends. Um, at our community, we also have manager on duty. So me being a, one of the directors, I am there uh, on a weekend and for a couple hours on Saturday and Sunday just to make sure everything's going fine. Um, but the other thing, of course, is we do have the life alerts for our residents for personal safety. So if you're even outside of uh, your apartment and maybe walking in the courtyard, um, that life alert will ring if you're 57 acres, you know, on our community, it'll ring to the receptionist and get you some help. So uh, be sure to ask that question, you know, what's your safety security protocol, because um, that's a really important thing to know. Yes. Hi. Um, so for our facility, um, so we do have um, where our residents, families, and like anyone who's visiting only comes in and out of our front entrance. Um, all of our um, outside entrances, you have to have like a badge to scan in and out. Um, and then our doors do lock at my building at 6 p.m. and then they open back up at 7 a.m. But there's a button that you push whenever you enter, it sends an alarm to the nurse's station and then the nurse's station will buzz you in. That's just for safety. Um, we do um, on like nursing floors, um, we do do hourly rounding. So there will be somebody kind of going up and down the hall, checking in on you. Um, and then all of the rooms do have uh, three call lights. There's two in the bathroom area, one in the bedroom, um, typically by the bed. And you can just pull your call light if you need assistance with anything. Um, and then we um, 
I'm trying to think anything else. Um, we are, we do have a rep receptionist during the daytime hours. Um, during COVID, we used to do like sign in and out. We don't do that anymore. And then we also do do the manager on duty where there's always a manager um, on duty on the weekends. And then we all kind of rotate. So it's usually a department leader. And that's kind of about it. Do you want to add anything? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Very yeah. similar, mostly mobile. Uh, mobile pendants that you could wear if you choose. You can also opt not to, but uh, you can ask for assistance wherever you are in the community and not just in your room, because we all know that things don't always happen right next to the, the call light on the wall. So, um, and then the doors lock at a certain time, but you can always code in and code out. I know uh, one thing that has been a bit of a shift, but not so much is the settings rule came through and was implemented where like really the focus of the communities for the the federal government and Indiana state government is they it is free freedom of movement in and out of the community and that's something we have to we, we want you to be as involved in the outside community as possible but we also want to make sure that only people are inside the community that need to be in the community uh, if that means difficult discussions with a niece or a nephew I mean sometimes that is what that means uh, because we don't want someone else's family being disruptive inside of the community for other people um, one thing I do love about Carmel, if you call the police, they're there in like 10 minutes, <laughs> like maybe five. It's like, they don't have anything else to do. It's beautiful. <laughs> um, and they're, and they're very, they're very kind when they come to the building. So they, they, they aren't bothered when we call. I mean, there, there are instances where they are called and they are very fast. Um, so that's, 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 that's a nice, nice tip for that area. But. Um, just some clarification. My doors do lock in the evening time, but they lock from the outside. So residents can still come and go as much You're as not they locked please. In. You're not I've locked heard. in. Um, it's just from the outside. Yeah. Okay, great. Any questions about that? Yes, ma'am. I'm going to bring the mic to you. You've skipped over question three. Oh, we did. What are the average? Oh, I did. What are the average rates for the different living options, and what is the typical? What is typically included? I totally missed that. You were on it today. <laughs> Barbara made her her mission to keep me on track today, and I so appreciate her. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, so our pricing is kind of dependent on the area. Um, and we kind of set our pricing kind of dependent on competitor rates as well. There's a lot of factors that go into it. Um, and then we also do dynamic pricing depend like kind of like supply and demand um, for our buildings as well. So, but I would say typically our range for assisted living is roughly going to be in that like $3,000 to $4,000 range for base rate. And then we do have a level of care pricing depending on how much nursing services you're needing. Um, a level one is no additional cost and then it kind of goes up from there. We do only have four levels of care no matter which trilogy building you're at. Um, and then we typically have a community fee that you pay. It's like a deposit that you pay upon admission. Um, if you want to also put a deposit down for a room, like if a building is full and you want to eventually move in there, then you can pay the, the community fee as your deposit before you move in. Um, what's going to be included is all of your activities, all of your outings, um, laundry, meals, um, basic nursing care. That's where it's like the level one. Um, but like you can't be on greater than like six medications for that and things like that. Um, and then, uh, like maintenance is included. Um, housekeeping is included for assisted living. They'll usually do like a deep clean once a week and then as needed. Um, and yeah. Um, independent living is a little bit different. I can't really speak too much on our independent living pricing. Um, I know that they have a community fee as well. I know that they have a base rate. I don't believe that they have a level of care because they typically don't provide a lot of nursing care on an independent living. Sure. Oh, yeah. I was oh. going to ask that. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, yeah. Is there a second person fee? So if I want to, I'm moving in there with my spouse. Yep. So there is a second person fee um, for... Um, our buildings, we also have like a companion rate. So if you own, if you want a companion room and you want a roommate, then you would pay for kind of half of the room. And then there would be a companion fee for that other person that moved in. If there's a second person fee, that's typically going to be like a spouse. And then you would pay the base rate for the room. And then there would be that second person fee. 
So second person fee is different than a companion fee. Yeah, that's how companion ours is like is we're going to be rubies. Yes, like second you... person is we're life partners. Yes. Okay. Yes. Got it. Yep. So like if you have a best friend who you want to move in with, then you guys are going to be each charged the companion rate. If you have a spouse, then it'll just be the second person, and then you guys will each get a level of care as well. So at Carmel, our our fee is based upon the payer source. I know. We've thrown some different terminology at you, and one of them is Medicaid waiver. Medicaid waiver is set up for people that um, if they're running out of funds, they can get onto a program that is based in their Medicaid eligibility that allows them to live in the exact same apartment as someone who's there on private pay. Uh, the 941, we have one bedrooms, two bedrooms, and uh, studios. The 941 provides for a studio. A one bedroom is 1041, so it's a hundred dollar add-on, and then a hundred dollar add-on for the two bedroom. Um, we do have companion availability, and we we have I think uh, five or six different couples that live together right now. It is less than the base rate, if but it can be subjective. If two people are on Medicaid waiver in the same room, there is some changes with that. Both of them are receiving care through that program. So it's it's reasonable. There's some reasonable flexibility in that, and we try to be as reasonable as possible. Now, our uh, private pay is very similar. Uh, the one thing I do like to tell people about our waiver program, though, is uh, we I'd say 67 of our our current 90 residents are all on waiver, um, and we do not require you to have lived at the community for any length of time prior to using your waiver nor do we limit the number of waiver beds currently available in our community. The only limit to our beds is the number of rooms that we have. Um, so that is, uh, if you if, if waiver is something that you need, that is something you should ask about. Um, because if you say, sometimes you have to pay one or two years worth of private pay prior to being allowed into waiver. So you'll be paying a private pay rate. And, and we will, we know some people don't have two years of private pay before they can make that decision. So it is, um, but when you get into waiver, that is all you pay. It's that 941, 1041, or 1141 for depending on room size, and then everything is included. The level of care no longer changes. Our level of care goes from one through six on our private pay, and it's $200 per tier. So it goes up in tiers based upon what you need, and it's an assessment that is done prior to you moving in, not that, you're, not that your tier can't move later like it can, um, just like anything else, because, you know, we all change over time. But uh, our current IL offerings are between $1,200 and $1,600 for the studio, one bedroom and two bedroom. But that does not include meals. Meals can be a separate a la carte program, typically, because, you know, our independent people like to be independent. Um, so they like to use the, every... Every room has a stove and a full-size refrigerator, so you can operate very independently inside of our apartments if you choose. And if you choose you don't want to cook and you want to just go down go down to the dining room and eat with everyone else, that is also your choice, and we respect that. Uh, so at Westminster, uh, we have three different options for independent living. You can be in a house. You could be in an apartment. Um, we have two different types of apartments. We have luxury apartments in our Tamarack Villa, uh, which has balconies and patios and all the bells and whistles. And then we have an affordable apartment complex called Elmwoods. Um, that apartment, you get all the same amenities. It's just a little bit smaller, and you have an efficiency-type kitchen. Um, the reason why uh, is because you also get a meal plan for our dining room, which is like a restaurant. So um, either no, uh, so many of our apartments have kitchens, people realize that it's fun to go down to the dining room for socialization and you get a, a you get some free meals out of that. So um, our range for independent living could be anywhere be below uh, $2,000 a month on up to $6,000 a month, just depending on what type of apartment you want because we have some that are one bedrooms on up to three bedrooms that are almost 1600 square feet. Um, for assisted living in our community, um, we're a little bit different. Um, we're not for profit, so we don't have levels of care. So you could typically pay 
between 5,000 to 7,000 a month, but that's all inclusive nursing care. We don't have levels. So um, obviously the 5,000 apartment, it, we have three different buildings. One of them, they're just a little bit smaller, but if you want the higher apartments, we just built a building about six years ago. It has heated floors and and vaulted ceilings. And if you want all the bells and whistles, you can have it. But we have many different options. And I hope that helps because it does get confusing when it comes to pricing. I would definitely um, give some time when you go to these communities and really just go over and over. I mean, this could be an hour conversation, but it's very good to kind of know what all is included. I'm going to piggyback off that because that's kind of what I wanted to say, too, is the bottom line is shop. Um, don't, you know, don't pick the first community you go to, you know, shop all of us and, and then some. I mean, I mean, that's the point. You got to find what fits for you. The bottom line with the pricing, when you really start comparing apples to apples, we're all in the same ballpark, you know, because we competitively price against each other. We want to make sure we're competitively priced. So just make sure you have a full picture of the price, but then come back to what's most important to you. Is it the food? Is it the activities? Is it the care? Um, and I know a lot of these prices sound expensive, but when you sit down and start to calculate all these things that we've mentioned here and on top of like your uh, utilities, which are, as we know, going up and up and up every year, uh, those are type of things that are included in the cost. So when you really sit down and sit down with a salesperson at a building, go through that. What are your current expenses compared to what you're going to be paying here? Because I think a lot of times it's very eye-opening. You realize, oh, I'm actually spending a lot of money when I start calculating all this stuff. And especially now that you're including food and your utilities and potentially transportation. So you could get rid of your car if you wanted to and not have to pay the insurance. So all those things can truly add up. But, you know, my biggest advice is shop. You know, just just go look at everybody. Find that place that you feel most comfortable because price is price. But at the end of the day, care and quality of life are much more important. Um, I just want to add on our level of care pricing. So we will do an assessment um, before you move in. And then that will kind of be where you fall as far as level of care. And then it's based off of nursing charting. And we will have a care plan with you if that changes to let you know, hey, you had this, this, and this. That's kind of been the determinant that you're going to be moving on to like the next level of care. So we will discuss that. We have open communication about that. So you won't just like get a higher bill and be like, what happened? Um, you'll understand kind of what moved you to that next tier. And just because you're at that tier for one month, let's say you are sick that month and you need more care then you know, the next month, once you're feeling better, then you will, then you will likely move down the level of care. You can fluctuate between the two. Um, we also have different uh, types of living um, apartments. So we have studios, we have companions, we have one bedrooms, we have two bedrooms, and all of those are priced differently. So if you are somebody who's on a fixed income, we can kind of sit down and work with you and be like, okay, which option is going to be the best for you and how do we get you to that place? So I'd just add like to what Sean was saying, you, you do need to shop and this is an endorsement for working with me, but just if you're thinking about this move, please be proactive. We've covered a lot of topics today so far, a lot of terms, a lot of things to think about, and it can be very, very overwhelming. On top of the pricing, is the lease month to month or is it a year? There's so many things to consider, but I had a, uh, I, I toured a daughter who was looking for her mom last week and the first community we went to checked all the boxes. She was completely over the moon and said, this is it. This is where I want to go. Should I move forward? And I was like, as much as I felt good that I, you know, got everything right for her. I was like, no, we need to go. Let's go to one more. I want you to see that. And it, and it allowed her to get a different perspective. It allowed her to see, oh, maybe that wasn't exactly what I wanted. I do like this different. And it just, she's going to make a better decision, whatever that decision is. And so as you consider this move, as you think about everything that we're talking about, just be proactive and start to think about what's important and sharpen that pencil, like Sean said, and that's any of us will help you navigate that. Yeah. And um, just like we said, uh, just like a buyer's agent, when you're buying a house, they tour you on, on the houses that meet the criteria that you've told them what you're looking for. That is Dave's job, except for it's a senior community. So 
he literally, it's his job to know the ins and outs of the communities in central Indiana. So if all of this seems overwhelming, you can just call Dave. <laughs> Dave, and you thought there wasn't going to be a lot of questions. There wasn't going to be a lot of questions for you. And I just knew it. Okay, let's go. I'll go here and then I'll be, I'll be back to you. Here you go, sir. Dave, how are you compensated? Great question. Yeah, so I'm, I use that uh, analogy for Lisa and Sarah. I get paid a referral fee from the communities. If I'm the lead source and I bring them, bring you to them, they will pay me a referral fee if you move forward. So there's no cost to work with me. It's just like engaging a realtor. So I don't, I don't play favorites. I'm there for you to make an educated and informed decision. And that, that that's my, that's my goal. Yes, sir. Just on top of that, so that's no different than these online services like A Place for Mom, Caring.com, those type places. Again, the big difference is Dave. Uh, I'm, I'm just Dave's excited. Dave's not going to sell your info. Because when you, when you get on those sites, they're going to blast you out to 25, 30 communities. You're going to get bombarded with phone calls. It, it's, as you can tell, I am not a fan of those services. But, but I am a big fan of Dave because, again, Dave is personally involved. I think those companies, uh, I could relate them in the real estate world as to like a Zillow. Uh, so if you if you engage with somebody on Zillow, you're, there are agents who pay thousands of dollars every single month to be um, to be featured there. So if you engage, like I want to know more information about this house, you're probably going to get called by about five to ten to twenty five real estate agents, especially in Central Indiana because there are more than ten thousand of us, which is crazy. Because uh, there aren't that many houses on the market, um, but that is what I sort of uh, liken some of those services to. So um, Dave lives in in Central Indiana. He engages with these communities in person. Um, so he's boots on the ground, just like a local real estate agent, um, boots on the ground. So yeah, um, we had one question, and then I'll get to you. Uh, I see your hand, um, and I'll check on line two. This is a really good question about um, state licensing and um, rating. Uh, can you guys speak to that? Does that number of incidents? Yeah. Right. Uh, yes. So it, wherever you go in any community, you can actually read state results surveys. I mean, it's in most binders and you can ask for it and you can read it. Um, another good resource, if you go to Medicare.gov, you can actually compare um, communities against each other. And, you know, key questions, how fast are the call lights being answered? You know, is pain being managed? You know, things like that. Um, I would also recommend to read reviews. You know, go on to the community's website, go on their Facebook page, see what living is like at that community. If you know someone who lives there, talk to that person. Hey, tell me about your experience. What's some good things about this community? Or, you know, tell me are some negatives. I mean, there's no perfect community out there, but, you know, knowledge is power. So do your research. And luckily now we have so many resources and you can go online and you can read things and um, hopefully you'll be well equipped to make a good decision. I would encourage you if you're, when you're on doing your online research and you get different comments, like feel free to ask us about them. Like, you know, there are um, people that love to use Yelp and they love to leave reviews on Yelp and they, they are not a positive force in the world. But uh, if, if you have questions about anything specifically, if you read a survey thing, just ask your community if they are, if they're not transparent with you about that, then you may you may have already gotten the answer you wanted. Um, now, when it comes to the star rating of things for CMS Compare, CMS Compare does not actually rate assisted livings. Uh, it's the the five star. Uh, it's it's a flawed rating system that CMS does based upon like a three year survey cycle plus a staffing rating that is very hard to calculate and understand. And then on top of that, you have a a quality measure. Quality measures are actually probably the best rating you could look at because it is a more accurate snapshot of how the building's operating right now. Most of the the larger star ratings they drag on over a period of years, so um, there could be a five star building that is legitimately not that um, because they've had something happen that hasn't actually 
affected their rating yet. So, um, but then your, your best tool is to ask questions about those things. If you have questions, you know, John, why is your one star staffing? Well, it's a measure of this and this, but it also does not affect assisted living. Just ask what the ratio ratios are from how many staff members do you have for X amount of residents is really a good indicator of what you're looking for. And we should all be able to tell you how we staff a floor. We're all going to say, well, it's based on occupancy and acuity, but there is an answer. And that's like, well, we use one nurse and one aide for this many people is what we benchmark. And they should be able to answer that question. Or we should all be able to answer that question. It's not, it's not, it's not rocket science. And we, and as an administrator, and I mean, I look at that stuff every day. I, I set the staffing patterns. I, I am definitely able to answer those questions and they should too. Yeah. The only thing I will add, cause he kind of stole my thunder there, but the, 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 the five-star rating is very flawed. Um, but if you get on, if you get on medicare.gov, they still call it nursing home compare. If you Google nursing home compare, uh, you can look at the five stars, but to his point, and he's spot on, look at the quality measures. So you can click through the different categories Click on quality measures because that shows you how many residents have falls, how many residents develop wounds, things like that. How many residents have UTIs? Those are the things that really should matter because that's the clinical care. So really focus in on those quality measures. Like you said, the staffing and some of those other numbers are very flawed. The survey info is also on there so you can view state surveys, see how many infractions they've had. But again, ask questions because, and he's an administrator, so he'll tell you, some tags are very minor. Some, you know, you can see a place that has 10 tags. Those 10 tags could be for silly things that aren't really about care. So, you know, just ask those questions because I think it's important. Same with Google reviews and those type of reviews. You know, we have a lot of turnover in our industry. So we have a lot of ex-employees that will go on there and leave a bad review. So just ask questions. Just let it prompt you. I really focus in on recent reviews, kind of like when you're on Amazon. If I go to Amazon, I look at recent reviews. I want to know what people are saying lately. I think that's more important. So pay attention to that. Yeah, I just want to say to what John said, I, I always share the state surveys with the clients I'm working with, and he's absolutely right. I always tell the families, if you get like any sense that they're not answering this truthfully, it's public record. They should not run from that, whatever that tag is, good, positive, or indifferent. They should have a conversation around it. And I'll tell a really quick story. I had a situation where we were reading the state survey, and it had a uh, the way it was written, it said there was 12 falls and it was like, Ooh, God, 12 falls. That, that, what are they doing over there? That's terrible. But as we talked about it, it had to do with their licensing. So residential licensing cannot restrain their residents. And this, this person was in a, a memory care unit, so she could not be restrained. She couldn't remember to use her walker. The community had to call the state every time there was a fall. So now there was 12 records of this person falling. They had met with the family and said, do you want, what do you want to do differently? We can't do one-on-one -on -one care. Do you want to pay for this? And they said, no, we can't. If mom's going to continue to fall, we'll just deal with it. We know she has dementia. So it was almost a positive thing that now the family understands it. They were doing their due diligence, reporting it to the state and that, you know, but it was an understanding for the families. So there we go. Um, I always liken stuff like this to the real estate world because that's the world I live in every day. I, I would say, and tell me, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, a survey um, in real estate represents a home inspection. A home inspector is a generalist. They're not in real estate or housing repairs every single day. They're not a plumber. They're not an electrician. They know the codes and they mark what is missing on the code. Does that so? There are certain things to look at that we know are important, um, and, and probably the same if you're in a community. Kind of accurate. I mean, there, there's definitely a checklist that they yeah. have of things they have to sure. obs absolutely observe. I will say, and again, the administrator can probably speak more to this than I can, but I've noticed over the years, every year they have something they're really focusing on. Oh. They'll have those one or two things they're really going to zero Maybe in there's on. there's a grant really, for that? Yeah, so 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 every once in a while they really focus on whatever that might be. When a one year in Kentucky, it was all about CPR and, and how the CPR certifications were happening. So if there was anything loose there, they were just nailing people with it. So there's always those things as well. Yeah, and and I can tell you since 
COVID, uh, they are coming in because there there was a period where they weren't going in and doing their yearly checks because of, of mm. COVID and so on. So um, they're a little backlog. So now when they're coming in, they are coming in to really look for details and deep clean and, and also keep in mind that, uh, you know, there are financial penalties sometimes that communities are charged. And so that's income for the state and so on. So there's a whole other world out there. And I agree with everyone um, about the, the, the surveys, but just, just do your homework. It's worth it. We are running short on time, guys. Just we're at, yeah, time flies when you're having fun. We're, we talked a little bit about how do you handle transitions between level of care and residences um, when the resident, when the needs change, the healthcare needs change. Um, do we need to talk any more on that? Does anybody have any questions about that online or otherwise transitioning from different levels of care? Do any of you, when you're transitioning to levels of care, how many of you, it requires a move to another apartment? Depends. Okay. It depends. All right. And you work with the families with that, I assume. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Uh, yes, ma'am. I'm running back there. I wanted to get this question in, so I'm going to call it a transition question. <laughs> um, what do your visitors do with the residents when they visit? So like when you have somebody like I have an elderly parent who's moved into some type of home at whatever level, now we're going to visit and we're like, well, now what do we do? And we sit there and I just thought maybe you'd have, since it's, you know, different facilities, some ideas on what can visitors and residents do. And it comes from both sides because the resident it's like, I don't want you to drive two hours here. Now we're just sitting here. Uh, he feels guilty, you know. So do you have any ideas? Um, so it's sort of transition, right? We're moving from one place to another. How do you visit somebody? And if you're the one in, like when now, when I'm the one in the home, how do I make it entertaining for the visitor? Mm -hmm. Great question. Such great um, questions. I can start. Okay. Um, so at our facility, um, we have a lot of open areas. We have like a cafe area. So you guys can like, there's always daily um, like snacks and things like that where, and we do like popcorn Thursdays or we have happy hour on Fridays. We do live music in the mornings, every morning at 10 a.m. on Fridays. So you can kind of plan your travel trip around that. Um, we also provide everyone with um, like the monthly calendar of activities. So families are more than welcome to, you know, bring their loved one down for the craft that day or exercise that day and participate in those types of things. Um, if it's movie day and they're showing a movie, then you guys can go to our movie room and watch the movie together. So there's different activities throughout the day, um, even in the evening time that you guys can participate in as a family. Or um, like we have our private dining room where you can rent that out if you um, if it's around like a birthday time or something like that, you can use the private dining room and have like a party for them. Um, you can come in specifically at meal times, and we provide all of our um, patients, their families with free meal vouchers whenever they admit. And then you can also purchase more if you run out. Um, so you can plan your trip around that. Um, we do Sunday brunches the third Sunday of every month. It's like a huge buffet. Um, our All of our meals are chef prepared. So our chef does that. So you can plan like to come every third Sunday and visit for brunch. Um, we also have things like board games and a movie room and a living room. And you don't have to just hang out in their room. There's a lot of other options as well. You guys can do chess or checkers or do um watch a movie so it's really whatever you want to do um the facility the whole facility is their home so whatever you used to do at home you guys can do that together at the facility as well the question is about staffing i know there's sometimes uh, you hear shortage of nursing staffing and um do you ever experiencing that and also, is there a lot of turnover in nursing? You got it? Yes, and yes. <laughs> Hi, I'm John. Um, yeah, uh, so yes, staffing, especially with the pandemic, was an extremely challenging aspect for every single one of these communities. And, um, you know, I worked for a different company during the most of the pandemic and you know it was it the focus was on trying to keep the same people there from a staffing standpoint it was a lot of 
loving on them and trying to make sure that they feel appreciated and protected and that you're doing everything you can for them. I think I had like a, before there were even vaccines available, I started talking from about six months prior to try to encourage my staff because I felt like it was the best thing to do to help protect the people that we take care of and to protect themselves and their families. Like it was, it was an extremely traumatic experience, but back to the direct staffing, like when I took over this building, it was sort of a, it was a very different dynamic. They had, uh, they were more than, we never used, the building I was at never used agency during the pandemic. So that means we didn't use temporary staffing. So, but when I moved into the community I'm at now, we were staffed almost 50% by agency staffing. So when you do that, you have someone coming in who doesn't know the people they're taking care of and might not even know what your expectations are. Um, you know, our first thing when we hire someone new is try to talk to them about what our expectations are and what their job duties are. But if you have new people coming in every every other day to try to do the same job, it is almost impossible to relay a constant level of of help and assistance. So it's harder. Um, and to do that, I think us as well as my my colleagues here have tried to create more incentives for people to stay in the same position and and maintain that that level. Now, I can go back to my staffing star rating if you want me to, because part of it is, it, part of the staffing star rating is your amount of turnover that you have. But because I didn't get the employee numbers from the people we bought the building from, it showed us as having like 200% turnover for years, even though I have employees that have been there like 20 years. Like the 40% of the staff that were there had been there. They were in it to win it. There are people that have been at this community that I'm running now for 25 years. And that's amazing. Like from cooks to activities, like there is like one person in each department that has been there. And I mean, that is that is their community more so even than mine. I, we we did pay them more bonuses. Have, what uh the way we we the way we countered that is we have a a shift attend shift in attendance bonus yes um that is an extra five dollars an hour for every hour worked each week That's as long good. as they show up on time they got to show up on time and they can't call off otherwise they lose that bonus so it incentivizes the correct but the behavior that we want like you know it doesn't it, we felt like it didn't do us any good to get into a wage battle with yeah. our colleagues because then we were just all upping it for the same results of, you know, some tardiness and other things. So we felt like the the bonus allowed us to be more competitive with our wage scale, but then also encouraged the type of, I mean, first step to any good job is showing up. Right. Like if you don't show up, you can't show me how good you could be the best nurse in the world, but yeah, if you're sure. two hours late, you're doing nobody any good. So that was sort of how we handled that. And then you, you also work on, I mean, we have education every month, so we get like shirts if you finished your stuff. I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of different ways to, that incentives I think- Incentives for your employees. Different building leaders can be very creative about how they manage that. Or, you know, I, I love to encourage my, my staff this direct care to get involved in some of the activity programs because it builds those kind of relationships. Like, you know, providing direct care is a unforgiving, I mean- yeah unforgiving thing. It's very, it's very difficult. And, you know, the people that do that day in, day out need to be celebrated way more than they are. But so to provide ways for them to connect on a deeper level or on a social level with the residents, I think is also a really big important to that retention piece. Right. We have an audience question, then we, we're going to have to wrap it up guys. <laughs> uh, good morning. I just wondered if you, how you can provide for people who have a special diet and I'm going to say specifically uh, a gluten-free diet. Hmm. It was as if I paid you to ask that question, because that was one of the next questions on there. Just real quick, like give a quick blurb, because it's 1127, and I want to be respectful of everybody's time. In my experience, it is a very difficult, a lot of places will say that they can do it. Um, it is a very difficult diet for us, the way that food is brought out in our kitchens to adhere to. So you need to be very specific about it when you are looking at the communities that you're looking at and have them assure to you that that is what they can provide. I would even have them sign something so that it doesn't come back later. They may ask you, like a lot of it's uh, gluten allergies are related to celiac. So having that documentation that you have that exact condition to ensure that your allergy is well noted in your record and that we have 
or whoever you choose has has said that they will provide this service for you, I think is a very important thing for you to protect that that expectation. Yeah, I mean, same thing. I mean, we have chefs in all of our communities. They're not just cooks, they're chefs. So they prepare diets. Uh, they'll prepare those meals specifically, whether it's a low-sodium diet, diabetic-friendly, keto. Uh, my brother has celiac, so I know completely what you're talking about there. So, um, But, yeah, it, it's just like he said, usually just need some sort of documentation to request it, and we can do that. The one thing I will say real quick, too, on the staffing thing, go, when you go and visit a community, ask him how much agency is in there. I think it's important right now. We we were all using it during COVID. We had to, um, but some places are still relying on it. And like he said, agency, they just don't have skin in the game. They 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 don't know you. They don't know kind of our philosophies and everything else. They're just there giving care. Yeah. They don't understand the day-to-day, -day, for sure. I will so, say Trilogy does not use agency. We, not. we did not use agency at all during COVID. Um, and we uh, still don't use agency in any of our buildings. Um, and we staff the same employees on the same hallways so that they get to know your individual care and get to know you on a personal basis. So you'll wake up and you'll have the same nurse giving your meds every day. And you'll know, hey, I trust this person and they're going to provide me with care. So... Yeah, I, I was just going to second that. I mean, l let's just say this working in healthcare is hard. I mean, we are regulated more than a nuclear power plant. Um, so it's difficult to sometimes keep people because sometimes they follow the money. But I will say, if you ask those questions, say, tell me about, you know, staffing, tell me about your, tell me about longevity of your staff. That'll help. I know I, I got on agency a little bit. We don't have agency now. It was the first thing I did as an administrator of my new community is Amazing. try to dial that back and, and find permanent employees to admit that. Those are, I guess I didn't end the conversation. I want to make sure you do that. Uh, hey, I'm going to do this drawing real quick. Um, there's so much that we could talk about with, with these guys. Yeah, can we give them a round of applause? Thank you. Yes. And thank you to our sponsors in the back. Be sure to visit them if you have specific questions. Uh, you've got the contact information for our uh, panelists, and then you can grab a, a card um, from our sponsors. So thank you for joining us online. I'm going to stop the recording there, and we're going to do a couple of giveaways in the room. So thank you, guys. Did everybody sign up? Who wants to? Yeah. All right. You want to draw, John? Drum roll, please. 